Hello, my name is Nicholas Hemingway. I am a second year master's student working under Professor Eric Severson, and today I'm going to present to you on magnetic bearings, and in particular, three pole active magnetic bearings. Some of you may remember my presentation from last year. If that's true, that's great. If you didn't have the opportunity to attend the WMPEC annual review last year, that's totally fine as well, because we're going to recap the progress of this research from its beginning, bring everybody up to speed, and then introduce new results that we've obtained since last year. We'll do this by first introducing the three-pole bearing topology that we're using in the study. We'll talk about its force generation principles. That is, if we run these currents into the bearing, what forces will we get out? We'll then discuss the inverse to that, namely, if you want this desired force, what currents do you need to run to get that force? We'll discuss an optimal bias field, which I'll explain a little more later. And finally, we'll share some experimental validation to show that everything actually works the way it is supposed to. This research can largely be split up into two main thrusts. One of them is developing this prototype I've got shown here on these slides. This is a combined radial axial magnetic bearing that can produce both radial and axial forces. And we're going to be using this prototype in conjunction with a bearingless motor that other students are developing in our lab. It turns out, however, that this particular bearing is just a subset of the more general three-pole bearing, which brings us to research thrust number two, and that is developing a general theory of operation for three-pole bearings. At a high level, active magnetic bearings are simply magnetic actuators that we put closed-loop control around. We've got an object here that we'd like to levitate. We measure its position with this position sensor and feed that signal back into the summing junction. We then take the air and feed it through position controller, which outputs a desired force command. This force command is then converted into corresponding currents that we need to flow into our electromagnet to produce that force that will ultimately keep our object levitating. We can see from all of this, however, that it's really important that we know how to relate forces to the currents that we need to input to produce those forces. We can see a general three-pole bearing here. It has three electromagnets spaced 120 degrees apart that can each impart a force on the rotor. I then have these blue unit vectors drawn that align with each axis of the bearing. Note that the total force output of the bearing will be the sum of the force component along the first axis plus the force component along the second axis plus the third component to produce a net force vector that we can represent as an x and y component in the complex plane. If we then note that the force produced by any one of the teeth is simply proportional to the field in front of that tooth, we end up with our final force expression that relates the force output of our bearing to the fields that occur in front of each of the teeth. Note that the A term is simply this complex exponential that I've rewritten for simplicity. We can see that the force expression takes on the same form as the space vector definition commonly encountered in electric machines. One thing that's common to do in magnetic bearings is to add a bias field to them, such that the total field in front of any tooth is the sum of a control component plus a DC offset. And you can kind of think of this as pretensioning the shaft or rotor. The reason we do this is because of the quadratic nature of the force field relationship. What you can see is that if we're sitting at a point of very little field, you have to change the field a lot to produce a very small change in the force output. If, however, we bias our bearing such that we're sitting higher up on this curve, we don't have to change our field as much to get a much larger change in the force output, which is great from a control standpoint. It turns out that adding a bias field can actually increase the force rating of the bearing as well, which we'll show shortly. In order to have a bias field, a magnetic bearing has to have a path for that flux to flow. We can see the bias paths of the prototype we're constructing shown here by the blue lines in this diagram. The flux is produced by these permanent magnets and flows axially along the rotor before flowing radially outward through the three-pole portion of the bearing. Here we can see the DC flux flowing outward in each of the radial teeth. We just pointed out that the total field in front of each tooth can be split up into a bias term and a control term. We can further note that the control field in front of each tooth is just proportional to the current flowing in that tooth's coil. If we substitute this total expression into the force equation that we developed earlier, we end up with an equation of this form here, where C2 and C1 are just constants that multiply the quadratic and linear term respectively. So if you give me three phase currents, I can convert them into space vectors and compute my corresponding force output. What we really care about though is given a desired force vector, what currents do I have to flow to get that force? 
So one way we could do this would be to linearize this expression about a zero current operating point. In this case, the first term just goes away and we end up with a simple expression where we can solve for the current space vector directly. Although simple, this method is not good enough as it can result in large force vector errors that can cause controller instabilities. An alternative to the linearized model is to solve the force expression exactly, and to the best of our knowledge, we're the first ones to have actually done this, and we currently have a patent pending on this algorithm. I'm not going to run through all of the details, but the general idea here is that we take our x and y force components, we plug them into this black box, where we're going to compute some coefficients, solve the roots of a cortic, plug the solutions into some more equations, and in the end, we're going to get out the three phase currents that we need to produce the force vector that we plugged in. The main takeaway here is that this is an exact expression that doesn't linearize the previous equation. And also note that because we're solving the roots of a cortic, we end up with four sets of three phase currents that we could use to produce our desired force vector. Here I have an animation that compares both the linear and exact current inversion methods. On the left, we'll watch the red desired force vector rotate through all of the force angles. The exact current inversion method will be able to produce this desired force exactly. The blue force vector is the force vector that results from using the simple linearized force model. On the right, we'll see the current waveforms that result using both inversion methods. At some points, you can see that the force resulting from the linear model leads the desired force and other points it lags. We can also see that the current waveforms that result from the exact inversion method contain significantly more harmonic content. So great. We've got this exact inverse that given any desired force vector, we can determine the exact control currents needed to flow to get that force vector. Let's now use this to develop some fundamental insights into the three pole bearing. We've got our three pole bearing drawn on the left side here. And if each one of the poles can produce a force, let's say up to F max along each one of the axes, we can see by simple vector addition that the bearing will be able to produce forces anywhere within this hexagon. We can also see that the bearing can't produce the same force in every direction. So let's define the rated force of our bearing as the minimum of this maximum force profile. It would be nice, however, if we were able to connect our three coils to a common neutral point such that we could use a standard three-phase motor inverter to control it. If this is the case, we no longer can flow currents independently in each of our actuators, which means that we can no longer produce forces independently along each axis. This also means that we can't necessarily produce forces anywhere within the hexagon anymore. So let's take a look at the consequences of this. If we set our bias field to be some fraction of the maximum allowable field in our bearing, this can be thought of as a design criterion that's usually dependent on the saturation point of our steel, what we end up seeing is that we're no longer able to produce forces along the hexagon. Instead, the maximum force that we're able to produce in any direction is limited to one of these inner contours. So we can see that the rated force of our bearing is decreased and is highly dependent on our choice of the bias field. If we then plot out the normalized force rating of our bearing as a function of this bias field, we see that we end up getting these two optimal points. Furthermore, what you'll see in literature is that it's usually common to bias the bearing with either no bias field or at half of the maximum allowable field. And we see that these are not optimal. By choosing one of these optimal bias points over the traditional points, we can actually improve the force rating of our bearing by 15.5%. So I've got the same plot shown here again that shows the same 15.5% increase in force rating, but what we can also do is get an idea of our coil current rating requirements that correspond with these force ratings. We can use the exact solution to determine the currents needed to produce the rated force at every force angle. When we do this, we can keep track of what the maximum coil current that was ever needed to produce that rated force was, and then we'll plot that current rating as a function of the bias field. And that's what we have here. Interestingly enough, what we can see is that by switching over from this traditional bias field of half of the maximum field to optimal, not only do we gain 15.5% in force rating, but we also require 23.4% less ampere turns for our current rating of our bearing, so we win in both cases. All right, at this point, we've developed an inverse solution that gives us the exact control currents needed to produce any force vector. We then use that to determine an optimal bias field that maximizes the force rating of our bearing, as well as decreasing the current rating requirements compared to traditionally biased bearings.
Let's validate all of this theory through our prototype that we've constructed in the lab. On the left side here, you can see the radial stage of our combined radial axial magnetic bearing. And note, for all of these tests, we're not using the axial portion of the bearing. We're just using the bearing as a test platform for the three-pole radial bearing theory. On the right side, you can see the CRAM prototype, and then we're using a commercial milling machine to hold this in place. You can't really see it, but the prototype is sitting on a six-axis load cell so that we can measure the force output of our bearing. And then we're controlling this using this custom power electronics cabinet that has various three-phase inverters in it. One of the first things that we're going to want to do is to experimentally determine these coefficients C1 and C2. And we can do that using the characterization procedure that we've developed as follows. Our force expression, if we decide to produce a force purely along the x-axis, simplifies down to this scalar equation for which I had is the amount of current flowing in coil one. Coils two and three will both carry negative I hat over two then. So if we sweep I hat and measure our X axis force, we can do a curve fit to data to determine C1 and C2. And these are the results. You can see that we ended up fitting data along each of our three coil axes and that the simulated data agrees very well with our experimental findings. So we've got our bearing characterized. Let's now use it as a test platform to validate that the inverse solution actually eliminates force vector error like we expect it to. What we'll do is command our bearing to produce a force of 100 newtons at all force angles using both the linear and exact inverse methods. When we do that, we get the following current waveforms. Note that the x-axis is the commanded force angle and not time. When we run these current waveforms into our bearing prototype and measure the force output, we get the following plot that shows the force vector error that results using both methods. The top plot shows the vector angle error, and the bottom plot shows the vector magnitude error. You can see that using the linear controller, which is shown in orange, produces significantly more vector error than the exact control method, which is shown in blue. This was really exciting to see for the first time as it validates the force model. We also used our exact inverse solution to determine the force rating dependence on the bias field. So to experimentally validate this, we ended up using an additional coil in our prototype that allowed us to vary the bias field of the bearing. For each bias field, we recharacterized our bearing, which is what you see here in this plot. Each run of data then corresponds to characterizing the bearing at a different bias point. After a bunch of post-processing, we computed the rated force at each of these bias points and then overlaid the data on the plot we created earlier, which is what you see here. You can see that the experimental data aligns very well with the theory, which is really satisfying to see. So this is the point in the presentation where I'm supposed to show you an awesome video of the bearing working and levitating for the first time. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, things have been delayed and everything has been put on hold, so that has not happened yet. But what we can see on the left side here is the CAD of the levitation assembly that we're using and it is sitting on top of the bearing here. And the way this works is we have a swivel bearing up on this side that allows the shaft to rotate and pivot about that point, while the bearing controls the other degrees of freedom of the rotor down here. On the right side, you can see the hardware implementation of this setup with the sensors being implemented. We've got an axial sensor up here and then differential displacement sensors for the radial section down on this end. This whole thing will then be sitting on top of the bearing. This is where I plan to resume my work as soon as we get back to the lab. So to conclude, we developed a new force current framework that allows us to determine the exact control currents needed to produce any desired force vector. We then use this to determine some fundamental insights into the three pole bearing and obtain an optimal bias field that not only maximizes the force output of the bearing, but also decreases the ampere turn requirements compared to traditional bias fields. Finally, we validated this theory with the prototype that we've constructed in our lab. For future work, the next steps will be to actually get the rotor levitating. When once we get it levitating, to compare the linear and exact controllers again in a dynamic sense, not just a static force vector air sense. Thank you.